Hi, Smart News. As we begin a brand new week, I'm reminded about the power and limitations of words. And I'll explain a little bit about that as I give you a lay of the land for today, but also moving forward into a really critical week. In order to do so and to kind of give us an idea, an overview of where we stand right now and what's happening in Afghanistan, I want to do something fairly old fashioned. Let me go ahead and bring up a calendar. So it is August 23rd, Monday, August 23rd. And this week is gonna be really interesting for several different reasons, but including the fact that on the 24th, which is Tuesday, there's gonna be a major meeting at the G7. This is the world's most powerful economies, democracies, and they're gathering for one key reason, to talk about what's happening in Afghanistan. And we're gonna be watching the word choice when it comes to this particular meeting, because there's a big question about whether or not some of these most prominent nations in the world will recognize or give a nod towards recognizing the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, which is what the Taliban are calling the country. So we're going to be watching the word choice on that. Take a look at this calendar, though, and look to August 31st. It's just a week from now. That's the deadline that the Biden administration set for the withdrawal of America from the country. So it is soon. You know, we just have a little over a week to achieve quite a bit, which is to get Americans and some of our allies out of the country. I wanna take you back to last week at this time though. So just take a look back to where I circled the green mark. I did that for a reason. At this time last Monday, the United States was not cohesively using the word evacuation. And we weren't either at Smarter News because I was watching to see, well, when do they actually start using that term, if at all? And a shout out to my colleague, Amy, who asked me just on Friday, hey, when did we start using that term evacuation? It turns out I went back and looked at the Department of Defense as well as the State Department press briefings to see when did that word actually start coming up more. It wasn't necessarily on Monday, although the Department of Defense started to use it then, but really Tuesday going into Wednesday when the United States government started talking about the evacuation that was taking place because words matter. When you start talking about it as an evacuation rather than a drawdown, for example, or a reduction of people, then you're in a totally different posture. And so this is the look at your two weeks. Last week at this time, this wasn't an evacuation officially. Now it definitely is. And that evacuation has to end more or less by August 31st. So the president just yesterday allowed some room in his and his his remarks saying that you know if they had to extend past August 31st that perhaps it could happen but right now that's the calendar as it stands we're talking a lot about the evacuations that are happening at Kabul airport here's a picture from Saturday I mean what an image of people getting on planes to evacuate just this morning actually right now as I'm giving this report which is just before eight o'clock central time there's still a question about security at the airport there apparently there were shots fired that included American and Afghan forces that have remained uh, as as well as others and there's some confusion as to what actually took place right now there's a report of one afghan soldier dead so the security situation is precarious there and it's important to note that this is still very much a developing story about and it could go a lot of different directions the president also yesterday was talking about that and saying that the united states is pushing out past the perimeter of the airport to try to go out and facilitate Americans coming to the airport and eventually being able to be evacuated. I wanted to show you this because we're not seeing as much about what happens after people get off a plane, right? If you're being evacuated from Afghanistan, and let's say you worked with the US government, what happens to you next? Here's a look at what happens at Ramstein Air Base in Germany. So these folks just got off a plane. You have to remember, they packed up what they could. And the, the likely scenario at this point is that they may never ever get to go home again. So they're in a totally new country and their future is completely unknown as to what really is their final destination. So this sort of brings home what's taking place. In order to even get to this facility though, remember that the US military is basically building a lot of this from scratch. Here's some images. You know, they're just pulling together some sites for people to gather because of the sheer amount, the thousands and thousands of people that are gonna be coming out of the country. Perhaps here's another picture of the US military actually building these facilities in Germany, one of the places that these folks will go.
this is sort of where we're at at this very moment with a lot of different pathways that can go forward. As we're paying close attention to what's happening at Kabul airport, I also want to show you what's happening in part of the country. Here is a map supplied by the Long War Journal, one of my favorite sources when it comes to issues of terrorism. And this is a map that they put together. See that blue area? We've talked a lot about the red. The red is the area controlled by the Taliban. This is the current map that they built of Afghanistan. So the red is the area controlled by the Taliban. The yellow is somewhat, um, the status is somewhat un uncertain, but the blue is an area of resistance. So there's so much talk about, you know, Afghan forces putting down their arms and not fighting and, and just sort of giving up. That's sort of an image that's been portrayed, but on the ground in particular, this district, this is a stronghold of people that are resisting the Taliban rule. And at this very moment, according to reports on the ground, the Taliban are going to this area to put down this resistance, but this is happening. And it's important to know that that's happening too. One of the things that we try to do at Smarter News, and you'll see with the president's briefings over the last couple of days, is I want to give you direct access to a source. So I don't want to uh, just have a bunch of debate about what someone's saying. I want you to hear directly from the Department of Defense and the State Department and the president what they're saying. And so I'll cut down a couple highlights. I did that as well, by the way, for the Trump administration. If you're new to Smarter News, we've been uh, we've been operating for three plus years now. So we've done this quite a bit. And I think three minutes of a highlights is, is usually a good time period. As we're getting more briefings from the president, though, and really the last week was about making sure that channel was open to you. I also want to just be certain that we're giving some balance to it as well, that it's not that we're giving you what exactly the U.S. government is saying, but we're also giving you multiple sides to the story. And there was a really interesting interview that was done on Face the Nation on CBS uh, just yesterday with Ambassador Ryan Crocker. He's a very interesting guy because he's worked more than 40 years for the U.S. government in many different roles as ambassador in Kuwait, in Iraq, and most recently in Afghanistan. He was called out of retirement by the Obama administration. And remember, President Biden was vice president at the time to serve in Afghanistan at a really critical part in the war. So he served for Republicans, he served for Democrats, he served the country for a very critical time period. And he was critical of the Biden administration and their handling of this evacuation. He also mentioned President Trump in his analysis of this, saying that President Trump also created the conditions. So you've likely heard some of this before, but I want to play a soundbite and I hope it works. I've never done this before on a live. So if it doesn't work, I'll slice it in when we when I get off so that you could hear it clearly. But one of the questions that we've been asking, we always want to go back to is why does this matter? Why does this story matter? What's some of the global perspective for it that we can provide? What are the stakes here? And he was asked a very specific question about some of America's adversaries. And I want you to hear it directly. I'm going to give you three countries, China, Pakistan, Russia. Have the events of the last two weeks made America weaker vis-a-vis -vis those three countries? It has created a global crisis, quite frankly. Uh, uh, it has emboldened uh, violent uh, Islamic radicals. Uh, and I think we're all going to see the fallout of that, certainly in Pakistan. They championed the Taliban because they felt they had no choice. Well, the Taliban victory, the narrative of defeating the, the, great, uh, the great infidel empowers radicals in Pakistan that they're gonna have to deal with if they can. And that's a country of 220 million people with nuclear weapons. China has its Uyghur Muslim population uh, in its West. They're tuned in. Um, they're, they're, uh, they're definitely looking at what happened in Afghanistan. Uh, and of course the Russians have their own Muslim populations in very violent places in the past like Chechnya. So they uh, might be doing a little bit of high-fiving, uh, but boy, it's not going to last because what is happening in Afghanistan isn't going to stay in Afghanistan. Uh, this will be felt around the world. So even if places like Russia and China, which President Biden mentioned, you know, would like nothing more than for us to be caught up in Afghanistan, spending money and time and resources, this is what the president has said. What Ambassador Crocker is saying is that that's going to be short-lived for everybody because this issue of Islamic radicalism terrorism is something that's present in countries all over the world, not only something that the United States is confronting, but Russia and China and Pakistan and beyond. One of the things that he pointed out about Pakistan that's very critical is that we have to remember those tribal areas of Pakistan. We talked about the border of Pakistan and Afghanistan. 
is a lot of those areas are where obviously the Taliban are traveling back and forth. Pakistan is a nuclear nation. It has nuclear weapons. This is always a concern of having a nation that has nuclear weapons that has a relationship with groups that we consider terrorist organizations. That's not a designation we have for the Taliban, but it certainly is Al-Qaeda. And Al-Qaeda in this particular part of the world is closely aligned with the Taliban. So he was able to connect some of the dots and I think it's important to remember to think globally about some of what we're discussing and not to be so focused on just what's happening in Afghanistan because the ripple effects are something that we need to recognize. I wanna just mention two quick things for you. The Vice President, Vice President Harris, is actually on her second foreign trip. She's in Singapore, she's gonna be traveling to Vietnam. So th what's important to note is that the Biden administration continues to stay focused on Asia. This trip was not canceled. It gives an emphasis of what the Biden administration is saying is really what they're gonna be looking at, which is much more towards China rather than some of the other areas of engagement. Final thing, nothing to do with Afghanistan, just wanna make you aware, because you might see some headlines regarding Pfizer. There's been all sorts of reports about what's happening with the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine. We know it has emergency use authorization and the reports are suggesting that it will receive a full authorization by the FDA, if not today, sometime this week. So watch for that headline. What's really important to note with that headline is that you get that authorization uh, that sort of approval after the FDA does a significant amount of review. What's really significant for the new cycle that we're in, we've talking a lot about vaccine mandates, haven't we? And what's interesting is that vaccine mandates or requirements have been held up in courts for legal standing for vaccines that have been officially approved, but not necessarily those that have emergency use authorization. So as we see vaccines move towards full authorization that gives more legal standing for companies or any, you know, where, you know, if we're talking school districts to, to require, to require a vaccine with exemptions. So that's an important legal standing. So we see the news, it's not only just a news about with the FDA, it's also about legal standing and some of these requirements you're seeing. So bringing this all full circle, words matter. Words have power, words like approval or evacuation. And we're watching the words that people in power use on any number of news stories. But now that we've seen the words, we know the outline, we have a little bit of orientation of, of the next steps that we're gonna be watching. Now we're gonna be watching for actions. What actions take place after these words are actually used? We'll be talking more about all these big stories. I have all of them on our website. I'm curious what you'd like to hear more about this week. So if you'd like to check out more of this video along with the links to all of our sources, are on smarternews.com, but really appreciate your support. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great week, everybody. I'll talk to you soon.